Hi, my name is Wes, and I am thrilled to welcome you to Refounding Fathers. So this is our monthly show that we do, and uh, super excited to have Chris back on the show. Christopher Souza has been active on our page for a while. Chris, how you doing, buddy? Doing great. Glad to be here. And then Kyle Walton. How you doing, Kyle? All right, guys. How are you all? Good. So, you know, with this show, we get to bring in really people from a variety of perspectives into the show. And we get to talk about our different beliefs and kind of trade what we think of as going on in the news, our perspectives on it. We get to be able to go back and forth and kind of dissect each other and then at the same time feel some criticism uh, back towards what we believe. So Chris tends to uh, represent that liberal democratic side and then Kyle represents the more libertarian conservative side. And then I kind of find myself often in the middle as the Birkin conservative here. So. Uh, what we're going to do today, though, is we're going to talk about how we actually brand this show and the identity that we're trying to cultivate. Um, as we move forward into this project, one of the things that we have talked about a lot on this show is the American founders and how important they were to both of our belief systems, really, in terms of liberal and conservative, um, but then also all of the differences that they had between them. And that's really led us to market this show as the Refounding Fathers in. We've talked about that in terms of principles. So I want to go ahead and bring that up as we move forward through this. So when we look at the Refounding Fathers, which is what we're going to call this, we are looking at how does, how does this show and our conversation start to model a way for our country to move forward that utilizes really the best of what the American Founders were and then at the same time tries to move it in a positive direction that they would approve of for today. So look at these principles I want to go through then I'm looking forward for you guys uh, to give me some reactions to that. So when we look at these principles the first one is to affirm the value of the founding virtues of liberty and equality. The second one would be to recognize the value of respectful discourse and debate. The third would be to seek the inclusion of women and minorities and the fourth would be to resurrect the spirit of collaboration that led to America's success. So that's what I'm excited to, to talk about tonight is to get into each one of these. But I want to ask you guys, because we kind of put this on together, out of those principles, Chris, which one speaks to you the most, would you say? Oh, man, um, they're all great. I think the, the first principle that you mentioned is really important. I think that uh, it's really important to stress principles that we have in common. Yeah. I think if you ask anybody, they will say that they are for freedom and equality. Um, now, when you really start to interrogate that, you find people have different ideas of what that means and uh, different degrees of when they think those values can be compromised and in what situations. Um, but I think starting from that uh, point of agreement and that point of, uh, like you said in the second principle, wanting civility, reasonable discourse. I think that is very important uh, if we do want more unity in our country. Yeah. So when we look at the um, the founding virtues, I think a lot of conservatives tend to uh, believe that the Democrats and the liberals in our country really don't share any of that belief system. Um, what would you say to that, Chris? Um, I would say we absolutely do. I would say, uh, you know, we may have a conception of freedom that is maybe more on the side of uh, what's known as positive liberties or positive rights. Um, you know, the idea that if you don't have health care, you are less free than someone who does. Uh, if you are living in poverty, you are less free yeah. than someone who is well off. Um, if you are someone who doesn't necessarily have white male privilege, you are in certain ways, your freedom is constrained. Um, so yeah, I think appealing to that core concept of freedom and just maybe looking at it in a different light is always important when speaking to someone uh, from the opposite party yeah. because you'll be surprised how many principles you do have in common. Yeah, and how about you, Kyle? What speaks to you when we look at these different principles of what we're trying to do here? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Chris. Uh, I, I think that we come to the to a point where we have to value uh, what the opposition has to say. We have to value what 
uh, our opponents or the people who uh, maybe have different uh, opinions or beliefs as us have to say. We have to come to that with a point of civility and understanding those people are are not evil. I think that we see that a lot in our society today that if you don't agree with me, then you are as abjectly wrong and, and maybe even malevolent in your belief. Yeah. And, and that's simply not true. Uh, but when I look at these list of things, uh, I mean, a lot of them seek, seek inclusion of, of women and minorities. I mean, obviously, that's a, a really big thing for, for us. Um, uh, but I, probably the one that speaks the most to me is to resurrect the spirit of collaboration that led to America's success. Yeah. yeah I mean, I believe that America is, is the best uh, place in the history of the world. Um, you know, I don't want to get into maybe the debate of American exceptionalism, but obviously I think this is the, the best, most free, most prosperous place uh, in the history of, uh, of the earth. And we're, and we're here for a reason. And so uh, if we can maybe rediscover those principles and that spirit that uh, got us to where we were, I think that maybe our future uh, will look that much brighter. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we talk about rediscovering these principles, I think uh, there's an agreement that we have that um, much of their, you know, purpose and spirit and the evidence of them isn't as present today as it has been in the past in American history. And I'm looking forward That's right. to talking about that. But I, I do want to go through them in a little bit more detail, really, you know, in this show to be able to explain why. Because as we just start to work on this together, I think it's important for, for people to see where we're coming from. So when you look at uh the founding virtues of liberty and equality i mean those are those are really the two major things uh, if you had to boil down all the work that went into the american founding and all of the different ideas from the federalist papers to the constitution the declaration of independence and the speeches and everything else is you know those words are loaded in terms of their meaning back then and then even more today and i look forward to having discussions about what that means because you're talking about that chris in terms of you know, the positive take on it versus the, the negative aspect of it, you know, in terms of what does it require for equality to exist, you know, which may be a, a different take on that than some of the founders would have had. Uh, but then maybe some of them would agree. So I think there's a lot of discussions we can have there. Um, the, the respectful discourse and debate, uh, you know, that I think that is really, really lacking today in terms of how people treat each other. We've talked about it extensively on this show in terms of the uh, confronting, you know, people that are different from you and how do you do that? But I think we sense a value in that. Um, and then uh, the third one I want to talk about for a second would be in terms of seeking the inclusion of women and minorities. I think that's one way that we can look at who the founding fathers were and say, even with all these great ideas, is you didn't see the presence there in those discussions, at the time, much of it based upon the time of women and minorities. And that's something that I would love to facilitate in this show is to be able to, to make that open. Even if we call it Refounding Fathers or as we work on that name, uh, making it clear that the whole spirit of it, the collaboration of it is what we want. And if that means that you know we get the opportunity to grow and learn how to do that better, then that's something that we're committed to as opposed to just you know assuming that everything that these guys said was right. And then that last one there that you were talking about, Kyle, of resurrecting the spirit of collaboration that led to America's success. Um, well, what do you think about that, um, Christopher? Do you think that there was a spirit of collaboration back then and that it's possible to regain now? And how would that occur? Um, yes and no. I mean, obviously, the founders brought together uh, an incredibly diverse uh, array of beliefs and philosophies and personalities um, wasn't necessarily any more civil than it is today. I mean, you're a lot less likely to get challenged to a duel and to die in said duel yeah. in today's politics. I mean, we had uh, lots of incidences in the past of uh, congressmen just being savagely beaten on the floor, right. um, which might sound like a good thing to some of us today. But, um, you know, the they were still able to come together and create something lasting and create something beautiful. Uh, and they're kind of under fire right now. We see some statues of, uh, you know, our founding fathers being taken down because some people can't necessarily distinguish between them and the Confederates, whose statue should be torn down, in my opinion. Um, they were very flawed. They were very imperfect. Uh, but somehow that spirit of collaboration came through. Yeah. So I think if they can do it, we can do it. 
Yeah. I, so I, I think, you know, especially on the right, Kyle, there's a belief system there that the, the Democrats don't have any standing when we talk about, you know, nationalism, patriotism, love for country. We've talked about that, too, on this show. Um, and, you know, when we talk about certain members of, say, Black Lives Matter and, you know, they're saying, yep, I'm a Marxist. I'm, I totally endorse that belief system. Well, it's easy to apply that to almost every Democrat. That happens all the time on the right. And yet, uh, do you share that belief? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, do I share the belief that uh, every every Democrat is a Marxist? What, what what's the question? Yeah, no, that's Sorry. it. That's it. Oh, that's the question. Of course yeah. not. Uh, of course <laughs> not. Um, no, I. You know, uh, I have some really thoughtful, uh, really thoughtful friends on the left. I mean, some that I I think are a little more, uh, I guess, probably in in the extremist uh, on the extreme side of things. But I have a lot of really thoughtful friends on the left who are able to have discourse, and even though where we agree on so many things. Yeah. Uh, I know that they're coming from uh, a good place. I know that they're not coming from a place that wants to uh, tear down all of America's, uh, you know, principles and all the things that hold us together. Uh, they're just people who who think differently than I do. Um, and of course, I have some friends who are, are hook, line, and sinker in the Marxist in the Marxist game too. Um, but no, of course not. I don't think every Democrat's a Marxist, and I don't think every Democrat is coming to the table uh, with with the destruction of America, you know, foaming at the mouth. So. Yeah, I mean, I think. For a lot of people, uh, they, they would probably actually disagree with that, right? There is a, an incredible oh, yeah. narrative that makes it seem like every single Democrat is, that they're trying to change the foundation of this country, that they're trying to you know, destroy what was. Um, and yet you're saying it's through that engagement that you have with the different Democrats that you kind of see past that and you start to realize there is more diversity in it than you originally thought. So. When we look at the uh, the founding fathers, um, who would you say Christopher like speaks to you that you actually see some identity with or semblance to? That uh, something to think about. Oh well, um, with Hamilton coming out tomorrow on Disney Plus, I gotta <laughs> give it up to my guy Hamilton. Yeah. Um, I remember even way years and years before that musical came out, learning about the dispute between Hamilton and Jefferson in high school. And Hamilton kind of wanted a little bit more big government intervention. He wanted that centralized bank. And Jefferson was very much no um, liberty to the point of libertarianism in a way. Um, and I remember in high school, the history books were very sympathetic to Jefferson and very um, kind of took a negative tone toward Hamilton that I could pick up. Uh, and my teacher kind of had the same negative tone. And I was just like, I don't know. I think this guy Hamilton has some good ideas. Yeah, you know, one of the things so, um, I, I enjoy discussing with conservatives is, you know, the fact that shortly after the the actual Revolutionary War, there was this experiment in extremely minimalist government with the Articles of Confederation that, that ultimately failed. And they realized we do need some form of federal structure that's stable to provide for the different states and coordinate them. Um, Right. And, and therefore, there was that disagreement. There was an aspect of we don't have enough government that I think uh, many Americans miss. So uh, but I'm curious in terms of, of how far you let that go, Christopher, because what a lot of conservatives see is they see uh, Republicans first um, perpetuating big government and then they see Democrats uh, perpetuating even more in their minds. And so they, they don't see any type of balance in this and that's the cause for for concern so how do you take that hamiltonian impulse and not let it go to the point of marxism which is what the right's constantly calling for where's the boundaries for it for you yeah i struggled with this a lot during the debate over the affordable care act yeah. um you know i was a strong supporter of getting more people access to health care and it was very successful at doing that and then the constitutional question came up of, is it constitutional to force people to buy a private product, in this case, private health insurance? And uh, the, court or, or, the court ultimately ruled yes, yeah. and it was something that scored my team a partisan win. I was very happy about that in a partisan way while still having doubts about the legal reasoning, which was a little bit contorted, and um, which 
does, uh, I think there is a very good argument that that was wrongly decided. Yeah. Um, I would far prefer some sort of universal health care law that uh, goes beyond the individual mandate. Now, uh, I do think the word Marxist is a little bit of a scary boogeyman word. I'm not really scared of Marxist. Now, if you go as far as identifying as a communist, then I don't really want to talk to you. But Mar I mean, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said Marx had some good ideas. You know, Marx didn't kill anyone. I saw a tweet the other day where he was kind of lumped in with like Stalin and uh, a lot of uh, communist dictators in South America. And I was like, well, that's a little unfair. Um, but I, I don't personally identify as a Marxist. I do believe in maximizing freedom whenever possible. I also think that there really is no small government party. I mean, when you have the Republican president whose number one policy priority for the last for you, uh, the last four years was building a giant wall to keep immigrants out and uh, uh, implementing all sorts of immigration restrictions that are very costly, um, I don't think that's necessarily small government. Yeah. Uh, but we all draw our lines in different places. Well, and then the same question for you, Kyle, is, you know, we're talking about there's no real party of limited government. What do you think of the Libertarian Party? Do you feel like they represent the American founders better than, than anyone else or no? Yeah, I mean, I get it. you know, I, I think we all understand that the founders were not a monolith. And, you know, there were what we call conservatives or liberals uh, on the uh, among the founders. And yeah, there were definitely people who espoused, you know, what I would call a more libertarian view. I think, you know, you kind of mentioned that, Chris, that Jefferson was downright libertarian in some ways. I think in many ways Madison was as well. And um, uh, but the Libertarian Party, I think, is just is really plagued <laughs> because it's just it's a catch all uh, today. You know, if you don't fit Republican or Democrat, uh, you you run as a libertarian or you become a libertarian. And as such, we uh, we have such a big tent that there really are no um, are no, I guess, guiding principles that really define who the Libertarian Party is. Um, you know, there's a joke that, you know, every every time a Libertarian gets in the room, they just screech about legalizing all drug use and sex work. And I think that's that's fairly true. Like, you know, we have substantive arguments uh, about so many things, about the size of government, about rights and uh, about about guns and, and really anything that you can imagine. But Whenever we get a spotlight, we we screech about uh, screech about sex work and and uh, and drug use. Yeah. So you know. Yeah, I mean that, that's exactly the point. Is that I think that the three of us recognize the diversity within the American founders. Uh, we recognize, like you said, Kyle, that they're not a monolith, and then we see uh, various critiques, you know, of the different parties which we also take in for our own belief system, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're someone more libertarian leaning, Kyle, kind of see the limitations of your party. And Chris, you've talked about that, how you don't identify with, you know, the whole Marxist framing, but you recognize that it exists. And, and then on the conservative side, I would totally agree. I would, you know, I would say that, um, you know, Donald Trump, many people want to project onto him the entire spirit of the American founding. And yet I don't see that type of collaboration you know, evident at all. And so where, how do we move forward in this? And that's where I think that we need each other, you know, in terms of our belief systems, keeping each of us honest. And when we lose that, which I, I feel that happening today, then we lose that spirit, hence the need for a refounding. And so what I'd like to do, and I think this is going to be the subject of many more conversations that we have, is to look at some examples, uh, really, that are happening on a daily basis now um, of people who are not really following these principles, right, uh, that we're trying to articulate. And then we can kind of talk about what the solution is to that. So starting off with it, I want to talk about, um, we're going to show a video here in just a second of Sasha Baron Cohen, who uh, essentially was trolling a right-wing rally and uh, trying to bring out some of what, you know, he was looking for was the racism within some of the people and by singing a song and then not knowing it was him. So let's look at a clip real quick of, of him doing that and then talk about the result. Okay, 
Okay, so you just saw that video of him singing, and he's got this bluegrass band behind him that's playing, and he's got this tune, but then it, it gets progressively more racist, and he's trying to bring that out. So what was, let me start with you, Kyle. What was your reaction when you saw that happening? Yeah, for me, it was it was, it was frustration uh, to the max. I mean, especially if you read the articles about uh, what was going on. So, yes. you know, the organizer of this event was a guy named Matt Marshall. Uh, expressly says expressly says several times in every interview I've seen, I'm not a racist. This organization does not promote racism. We are against it wholeheartedly. Um, you know, they had someone coming along kind of mysteriously to foot the bill. Should have been a red flag. That, you know, they didn't do their homework. And, you know, I guess now they have to suffer the consequences of it. But, um, you know, again, he expressly said he was not racist. They were not there to talk about anything racial at all. Um, but Sasha Baron Cohen comes dressed up, takes over the stage. And then as soon as he starts singing this you know, offensive song, Matt Marshall and others tried to get him off the stage. They tried to rush the stage. They tried to shut him down. But Sasha Baron Cohen had a private security team there who stopped them. Uh, to getting on the stage to to stop you know the the racism that was going on, yeah. and of course the camera is going to pick up the the one person or the two people in this this crowd that were you know laughing or singing along, and and now you know Sasha Baron Cohen's got the footage that he wants to paint every right winger, everyone who's you know not you know left of Trotsky as some sort of racist uh, redneck or or bigot or whatever you want to have. Yeah, I mean from what I looked at, he had actually his team had actually formed a a pack. A political action committee yeah. they called it back to work and um, as they were doing this they were you know selling themselves as a legitimate organization and then mm -hmm. um yeah completely changed it in order to to bring out what they they believe to be there and then when you've got this you know bluegrass band and they kind of they didn't immediately start with racist lyrics they kind of worked their way into it yeah. pretty quickly of course but like you know got people going and they're already in, you know, probably been drinking, having a good time, they're outside and all of a sudden they, all of a sudden they realize what they're into, they've already, you know, been caught participating in it and like, hey, what's going on? And then he's yeah. got what he needs. So I, I guess in, in that sense, I mean, I know he's a comedian, he's trying to be funny and I, I appreciate humor, but at the same time, uh, like you said, Kyle, I can see the perpetuation there of what he's hoping to find. Um, as someone who leans left, Chris, I mean, do you do you find this funny? You appreciate it? Do you think it's a good thing or, or not? No, I didn't see much humor in it. Uh, it brings to mind nothing but the Stanford prison experiment. You know, the idea that you can kind of uh, get people to do bad things and follow bad orders is a pretty old one. We don't necessarily need Sacha Baron Cohen to tell us that. Yeah. We don't necessarily need Sacha Baron Cohen to tell us that racism is a problem in the Republican Party. Um, that said... Uh, you know, I don't want Black Lives Matter to be judged for our dumbest uh, slogans or chants. Uh, so I won't judge uh, anyone at this event for that either. Uh, I've never been a fan of Sacha Baron Cohen. He tends to put people in really unwinnable situations very often, not necessarily saying this was that, um, when he isn't directly sexually harassing people. Uh, so, yeah, I just... We don't need him to manufacture incidences like this. We've seen enough very real videos of racism and harassment and racial violence over the past few months. I just don't see what this adds to the conversation. Right. Um, I, I, what I see it adding is for you know a few laughs, it's uh, creating enormous problems, right? And I think that was Kyle's point, is that it's uh, perpetuating a distrust uh, of conservatives for everyone who's not conservative is you know if you're a liberal and you think that conservatives are racist well then you can point to this manufactured situation you know and say oh there you go right and are there uh, people among the conservative movement who aren't racially sensitive uh, absolutely I'm sure there are there's people amongst almost any group that you can find that but to bring that out people to encourage it to fraud them to the and then capture on camera and then like you said Kyle to, to stereotype it and make it seem like it's all is, is just as bad as, you know, us saying that every Democrat is a communist, right? Um, and so, you know, that's part of that whole um, uh, movement that takes away from the spirit of collaboration that we're trying to yeah. facilitate, you know? Um, so definitely a place for humor. But I, I don't think that that's it, and I don't think the way that he did it, um, you know, was, was worth it by any stretch. But then, in fairness to uh, the left, 
we see that from conservatives all the time. Because I asked you, Kyle, you know, the question about, you know, do you believe every Democrat is a communist? And there's a whole lot of people who, who believe that. Now, I want to show you this, too. This is uh, an image that I saw on social media the other day that's been spread quite a bit, actually. And I'm going to read it to you. It's of Kamala Harris, who very well could be the, the vice, pres vice presidential nominee for the Democratic ticket. And the, uh, the text of it says, the communist Democrats are coming after you. We have lost our nation. And then it has this uh, apparent quote uh, by her that says, and once Trump's gone and we have regained our rightful place in the White House, look out if you supported him and endorsed his actions because we'll be coming for you next. You will feel the vengeance of a nation. No stone will be left unturned as we seek out in every corner of this great nation for you who have betrayed us. And then apparently she's supposed to have said that um, uh, last week. And, little, and at the end of the meme, it says, yes, she really said this. So, <laughs> this is being shared. Like, this is discourse in America today. Is They nailed it. It sounds just like her. Right. So what do you make of that, Kyle? I'm sorry. I, you're, you're cut out there. Uh, what do you make of that? Oh, well, obviously, it's terrible. Uh, you know, I think that in the same way that the Sasha Baron Cohen uh prank is an attempt to paint all of one side as a certain way uh only to appeal to you know your base that's exactly what we see with the meme that yeah. someone has you know fabricated this quote uh in an attempt to rile up you know trump supporters there's nothing trump supporters love more than uh feeling like they are they're fighting you know the big government or fighting these evil democrats or something like that and that's exactly what we see here is kamala harris who i disagree with on almost everything um but here we have, you know, this fake quote that is easily Googleable uh, to make sure that it is a legitimate quote. But instead, uh, you know, they fact checked it for us on the bottom and said, "This is a real quote. You don't have to fact check this." Right. Um, but yeah, this is just an, an attempt, just like the Sasha Baron Cohen thing, to uh, rile up one one group uh, against another group. But I want to look at. Uh, I totally agree with you. I want to look at, like, kind of break down this worldview that's being perpetuated because I think that's what speaks to people is you see the communist democrats so there's a belief system there that they the democrats don't enforce a left-leaning or welfare policy that they truly endorse communism there is a belief there they talk about losing our nation right it is this notion that if a, a liberal is ever elected that america is over um mm -hmm. right so that goes right. back to that uh founding fathers movement and if, if you there truly were liberals amongst the founding fathers then uh, America is not over if a liberal is elected. Uh, not necessarily something I'm going to support, but uh, to take it to the point that America is over if someone who's channeling that spirit um, of America is, is elected makes no sense. But that's the worldview that's put in place here. Um, and then you look at this um, this threat of vengeance, right? That no stone will be left unturned. Uh, you have betrayed us, and you know we're looking for our rightful place in the in the White House. Is there is this boogeyman aspect to this Chris yeah. and uh, for me as a conservative I think that the challenge here is how how do I you know how do I as a conservative myself uh, take a stand against you know Kamala Harris is not someone I'm going to support uh, without risking complete appeasement to the point that people say I'm liberal you know do you, do you see that uh, the difficulty for conservatives and I wonder if there's any empathy for it uh, at all Oh, yeah, I have a great deal of empathy for, you know, the reality based conservatives who do have to deal with so many on their own side yeah. coming after them just for pointing out objective reality. Um, you're a rare breed these days. <laughs> and so, of course, I do have empathy for that. Um, as far as what people are going to call you, they're going to call you a liberal for anything. I mean, I've been called uh conservative centrist Republican for things I've said about uh, people on my side who I'm not a huge fan of. But uh, the only option is to not get dragged down to their level, to live in reality. Um, I mean, identifying Kamala Harris as a communist, she was one of California's most aggressive prosecutors, put tons of people away right. for uh, drug possession uh, and other small crimes. She's not a communist. Uh, I see the same thing. Uh, I see Joe Biden referred to as a Marxist today on Twitter. And I'm just like, Joe Biden, really? You have the Dilbert creator saying that if Joe Biden is elected, uh, the world, 
conservatives will be dead within the year. Right. It's just insanity. And a lot of it is things, it, it sounds almost like the product of a guilty conscience or the product of just rationalizations. I don't even believe that a lot of these people believe it. The h- hatred of Hillary Clinton, I think, was very well uh, deep rooted. Uh, and these people coming out of the woodwork to say that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are the greatest threats to liberty and uh, the conservative identity, I just think is, it's kind of sad to watch because I don't think their heart is in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think with, with Hillary Clinton, there was a lot of personal, you know, vendettas and, and hatred there um, more so than ideological. But I want, I want to get back to, to what you said, which is, you know, you were saying um, that, that you've got empathy for a conservative who doesn't agree with that meme, who doesn't believe that, that every Democrat is a communist uh, and finds himself in this difficult situation, situ- uh, situation that you also find yourself in. And to me, Chris, that is the birth of a movement. I would be uh, happy to defend you if someone were you know, to go out and call you a Marxist or to, to dismiss your perspective. Um, as extreme or un-American because you've said and proven numerous times on this show uh, and in other you know, places on our page that you are you know, reasonably minded. You know, you've talked about the American founders. You, you know, are contributing to this country you know, um, as a, a smart individual. And even if we disagree on who we're going to vote for, I would defend you as an American, right? And you know, you're saying you would do the same thing for me and, and same thing with you, Kyle, so we can find aspects of the founding that we can each identify with. And based upon that commonality, we have to defend each other. And I, and I think that's the point yeah. of this show and, and what we are doing is I can't expect uh, Trump uh, supporting conservatives, every last one of them, to stand up for me, to understand me, to uh, you know respect the fact that I may disagree with them. On things that Trump does, like maybe a few, but there will be many that are going to dismiss me, um, and you can't expect that, you know, for you, uh, Chris, as well, for people on the left, if you, you know, take a stand against like Bernie Sanders or whatever it is. However, I think there's a space in the middle where conservatives, libertarians, and uh, liberals can get together and they can defend each other, not on the basis of ideological agreement necessarily, but on the basis of rational discourse. And yeah. change in these principles that we've articulated. Do you, do you see that as well, Kyle, from the libertarian side? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I, I feel like we're leading the charge on that. Uh, and that's probably because we're we're so in the middle of, of so many issues. You know, as liber- libertarians, I guess in the capital L sense, we're you know on on the right on some issues, on the left on some issues, and really just want to talk to anyone who wants to talk about ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're all for that. And, um, you know, I think, you know, if I could just kind of circle back, uh, I think it was Biden or maybe it was AOC, someone who talked about truth over facts, right? We care about truth over facts, um, which is a, a pretty crazy statement. Uh, but it kind of, it goes into, it goes into the Kamala Harris meme. It goes into the Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, thing. It goes into everything that's fueling the divisiveness of our country is that we don't really care if we're right or not, as long as we feel morally justified in the things that we're doing. Right. So I, I, I think that you're angry on this. I feel like I'm right on this. And so whether or not the truth is on my side, I'm justified in, in whatever I say. And I think that's just <laughs> incredibly problematic uh, when we are not willing to fact check ourselves. We're not willing to look in the mirror and, and say, nope, this was wrong. I shouldn't be supporting this. Or this was a, a fake quote that I should have Googled or whatever. Yeah. So No, that, that's a great point. You know, when I first saw that meme shared, I, I actually fact checked the person, you know, who um, who shared it in their, their comments. And I was like, hey, th- this is not anything that Kamala Harris said. And that's easy. And I gave some sources. Yeah. And the response was, well, I don't care. It's something that she could have said. And I've seen that increasingly on social media is that people get to a point where they don't care what the truth is. They don't care whether this person said this or, or did this. It, it fits the narrative. It fits the beliefs that they already have about them, and they're going to stubbornly yeah. stick with it. That, to me, is postmodern at its most extreme and most dangerous point that reality doesn't matter. I want yep. to stay with my worldview. And I think that you know the three of us, uh, Chris, can get to a point where you know, we can disagree on policy situations, but we can agree on sanity. We can agree on yeah. the need to 
uh, to seek the truth of what's going on and never get to a point where, you know, if we are if we are proven wrong or infactual, that we can't say no. And there is a, I, I see a lack of humility for the sake of perpetuating ideology. And I'm looking forward to, to having, you know, your perspective on this as we try to keep each other honest as best we can. So um, I do want to give you the last word, Chris, real quick. Um, but I, I, the, one other thing I wanted to talk about is that as we try to grow this movement, I'm going to seek out people that are, you know, rationally minded, whether they are right, left, center, wherever it is. And I'm looking forward to having that um, with Dr. Yuval Levin. I'm going to bring his uh, bio up now. Uh, this guy is just incredible. He's got a, a great book. I'm going to get a chance to talk to him uh, next week. Um, and we're going to go through that. And it's called The Great Debate, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of Right and Left. And as we talk about American founders and people from history that we identify with, he kind of traces back some of the belief systems of both the modern right and the modern left to these guys to various extents. And awesome guy, super smart, um, great resume here. And he's uh, you know been involved in the American Enterprise Institute, which is uh, one of the top conservative think tanks, but he's been all over and he kind of bring some of that perspective that we've been talking so looking forward to sharing sharing that with you guys and getting your uh, take on next time we do a show but i want to give you the last word chris um on this so talking about the postmodern piece and how to return to that that's my best guess any uh, any other ideas of how we can perpetuate that uh well one thing that gives me hope is that uh we are seeing a lot more agreement among americans in the polls on issues that have long been very controversial um, we're seeing a huge rise in support uh, for Black Lives Matter over the years, a huge rise in support for tearing down Confederate statues. Uh, most Americans uh, support the recommendations of the CDC and are wearing masks. So this culture war that is dominating so much of our conversation is led by a very powerful minority. Um, and you know, on the left, we have those people who are looting and rioting and committing arson but the majority of the people who are protesting are doing so peacefully yeah. um on the right we have this very large anti-mask movement but most republicans are wearing masks no matter what they say online their actual behavior isn't necessarily demonstrating that is it perfect no we are not um masking up as much as a lot of other countries, which is part of why we've been seeing this huge bounce back in the coronavirus numbers uh, of cases. But uh, it does give me hope to see that this groundswell of uh, unity that is happening. Uh, and I think that that is something that we really need to capitalize on and take advantage of. Absolutely. You know, that kind of sets us up too for, for the future is I'm looking forward to, to looking into um, the different organizations, you know, that are really involved in this culture war. And are they making it better or are they making it worse? Like, are, are they profiteering off of that? Uh, and if so, why? And, you know, what you're talking about is a distinction between how things appear on social media and how things are in real life. And maybe, you know, there are some differences there that don't make it out. And I'm looking forward to focusing on that. So thank you guys for your time. Uh, another awesome show. Love talking to you. Um, for, for those watching, uh, recommend that you subscribe to us on YouTube. Take a look at our Facebook, our website. Uh, we're going to look at producing this show every month as often as we can to facilitate the discourse. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Chris, as well, for your time. I'm looking forward to having you uh, next time as well. Thank you. Thank you.